struck us when we sat down to talk immediately after finishing up the week-long class up here last year was that Michael's done, done residential programs before, I had done residential programs before, his were out in snowy range at the campus out there with adults and mine have been with elementary age school children out at the Lamar facility in Cabins. And the biggest thing that struck us was that what we started calling the Yellowstone Factor. And that, basically what that was, that was that being used to working with kids, a preformed group that came with a teacher, um, highly structured, and 
it worked real smooth. The more structure we had in the program, the better it went. Um, teachers often followed up with things we did both beforehand. There's a lot of pre-class work. There's a lot of post-visit work. Um, it was a class. They had already been functioning as a preform group in a classroom setting, and so it went real smooth in terms of the expectations that we had. Um, with this group of adults, we found that, that I, it was a really full schedule, very structured, a lot of classroom time, a lot of field time too, but structured field time. Um, and there were, as the week went on, it became really obvious that there were strong desires, it being Yellowstone and it being 2.2 million acres in size. And yes, we tried to hit a little bit on wildlife, a little bit on the hydrothermals, a little bit on history, but there was no way we were going to be everyone's personal agenda. So people want to see a moose, and if they hadn't seen a moose yet, they were just chomping at the bit to get out there and see a moose. And so we started sensing this. We actually started losing some people that, that said, well, you guys are going to do this, but I've done this before, and I really want to get back to Old Faithful and do this. And they're just taking off in their cars, and, which caused us some stress because we had planned out what we felt was a really important sequencing of events and we wanted everybody to partake in it fully. Um, Michael's experiences with, with the programs, he'd done residential programs, he hadn't quite experienced this before. People, why do you think the difference, Michael, in terms of people not wanting to get out and see their own thing? Because it was more of an isolated setting? I think because, because this is Yellowstone yeah. and there's something yeah. very unique about Yellowstone and seeing Yellowstone and, and doing Yellowstone. And as we know, you can't really do Yellowstone ever, really do it. But it was certainly more of a factor here than it was, let's say, in the Snowies, where the setting for me in these residential programs is always very important. I mean, if what we're trying to do is, is help to connect people to an environment larger than, than where they live and where they work, having something in a space that uh, allows that to unfold. It's always been a part of the residential yeah. learning programs that we've done. Yeah. And once people got here, I mean, it was as if uh, they were in Yellowstone, and Yellowstone meant this, and they had mm -hmm. checklists. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so as we started thinking, this is, this is Yellowstone. This is a reality of being here. One, you can prepare in advance that you are not going to be able to see everything. And I think we've done that in pre-course mailings. But it's just too big. And here's what we're going to be focusing on, but we aren't going, and we're going to try and minimize drive time because it's so huge. We want to maximize time out in the park, enjoying the park. We don't want to spend the whole time behind a windshield. So we are not going to do the park tour. We're not going to do the Grand Loop. We're not even going to get to Old Faithful this time. Um, and, and that's okay. And if you, we, we invite you to come early, stay late, see whatever you want to see. But here's what we're doing in the class. And so send out the agenda in advance. We also built into the made the agenda much more open, and are trying to build in some time for self exploration, downtime where people can have more of a say as to where they're going and what they're doing. So we're focusing the academic, the the some of the lectures that we're bringing guest speakers for. That's all focused in the morning. Um, some of the morning sessions will be field sessions, but they'll be structured field sessions with going out wolf watching with a wolf expert going out to look at birds in Hayden Valley with a bird expert. Um, but the afternoons are all open. They will have the option of heading off on their own or coming on a hike somewhere, getting out, that I will be leading. So we're going to see how that goes. Well, I think that uh, it's easy to lose sight of I think, some really critical components of residential programs, and that is that they're organic, that they take on a character of their own uh, based upon the players. I mean, residential learning programs, unlike a lot of classroom learning programs, are designed, there's a great deal of potential anyway, if in part of that design, individuals are encouraged to be part of the teaching as well as part of the That's learning. A, One of the really fundamental important. pieces is, is knowing what people bring. The, that somebody is, is, a, is a good artist, that somebody um, does nature photography as a, um, as a hobby, that somebody uh, has, a bat, has a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a, a degree in uh, uh, biology or in uh, environmental studies yeah. or what have you. And, and that then becomes as much a part of the learning uh, experience as the, the people that come in and, and handle the program. Uh, plan activities that encourage people to interact, and that's part of the problem 
when individuals come here to a place like this and they really decide that they're doing their own thing, they come, they learn a lot, but it, it was, it's not the same kind of residential learning program that I'm sort of used to. In an environment like this, and, and when, we, when we're planning it, we're doing it in September, uh, it's unlike the programs that we've done around the campus where you have a large group of, of students that are participants. Now we've got a, an interesting group of individuals that have some excess capital that may be retired, uh, that are able to get the time off to come up here. Uh, students are in classes, and so there's very few students right now that are part of this experience. Uh, so in some of the early res residential programs that, that you've been involved with and that we've conducted, some things are different, but the fundamentals, I think, are still, are still very much the same, that uh, somehow everybody contributes uh, to, an, to an end, and that end is what individuals bring. And, and as we know about residential programs, the opportunity for a period of time to, to get away from one's daily responsibilities and stress. And, and that's often been sort of a, something that I've enjoyed about residential learning programs. They're so intense. Intense meaning that people are together. They cover uh, yeah, a large period of time. So you're living together. You're learning for, together. You're, you're, you're in the dorm together. You're eating all your meals together. You're recreating together during your downtime. It's, it is. Well, so, and there's just so many possibilities. At the same time, they've got the opportunity to sort of relax and to allow in this organic sort of way, I mean, new ideas or old ideas to resurface. I mean, they haven't got family responsibilities more. I mean, they're able to really, to the degree that they're, that they're interested, sort of commit to, uh, to learning and exploring. And, and that, that exploration and the opportunity to do that is, is so very strong. That's been the, one of the big challenges, as Ellen said, about Yellowstone, is people come and where you're hoping that after a day or two they can get out of the, uh, uh, the rat race, <laughs> out of their responsibilities. Yeah. So Instead, the every day, the they're checking that list, <laughs> and, they're, and they're as frantic as they were. And, that's, yeah. that's, and I think that's what is going to continue to emerge. Your question is, what do we hope they're going to get out of it? I think, hopefully, that uh, a lot of things that they hadn't planned on uh, – uh, that they're able to um, uh, increase some uh, some of their interests, um, have a feeling of of a, of a growing network of people that that share some of their interests, and that they have a relationship both w with the program and and with the park that um, uh, is going to mean a lot for a long time to come. I think in terms of coming to Yellowstone, what, what specifically about Yellowstone and places like Yellowstone that I'm hoping they all go away with is, first of all, a lot of knowledge, much, much deeper and broader understanding of the species that live here, how they relate to each other, what their habitat needs are, how we influence them, what it, our individual responsibilities are towards Yellowstone, towards wild lands, towards wildlife in general. Um, they're going to get a lot of that this, this week. We give them many opportunities to connect to a lot of things that are outside of, of their daily routine and and through the the animals on the northern range up here in the fall. I mean, it's a great opportunity to to do that in many ways. All right. <laughs> you know, uh, but the word buffalo has really has a has a real romantic connection to the West. The name, the word buffalo, um, so much so that today we refer to them as a buffalo or the American buffalo is regarded as a common name for these animals. But they're really a bison, and they're descended from. Uh, bison that's found and still found actually in parts of um, Eastern Europe on some of the preserves in Ukraine and Poland. Perspective of its history and the bison, the perspective of its and its natural history and the perspective of its management issues and the management challenges that we face. Alan touches on a very very good point about the bison today being uh, this issue being the most one of the most contentious issues in Yellowstone. Uh, it makes. It frankly does, despite all the controversy regarding wolf restoration in Yellowstone, it really does make wolf reintroduction look like a walk in the park compared to how we have to deal with this whole issue. Because 
Um, it's, it's a constant, ongoing struggle and battle to try to contend with how do we handle and how do we manage the animals in Yellowstone as well as out, when they get outside of Yellowstone and what goes on there. And I'm not going to be talking about that. She's going to be covering those kinds of <coughs> issues and uh, talking about that, the whole um, controversy and the challenge that we face in managing these animals relative to uh, the, the livestock industry surrounding Yellowstone and the whole issue surrounding bison and brucellosis. Let's see, Roger mentioned the really hard winter when 1,100 were killed was 96, 97. It was about five years before that that Montana had their public hunt. Now, that was not a public hunt when the 1,100 were killed. That was um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, a couple of Montana fish and game, I think. A bunch of different agencies were doing the killing. And then what was happening to the carcasses? They were being sent to Indian reservations and when there was an interest expressed by some of the affiliated tribes that they received the bison. They went a bunch of different directions. But, um, I'm <laughs> 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 I know I had some last year.